Good morning. We want to welcome in those from our center and also those uh, more than half of our or close to half of our uh, uh, membership that are active attenders that are watching digitally online. Some will be coming in a little later on the podcast. And we're just so glad to have all of you that are joining with us. I'm wound a little tight today. As you know, I've been a month without being able to preach on Sunday morning. And so I have saved up four messages for this morning. And uh, I'm ready with both barrels to fire away. I can roll on till around three o'clock and then we'll have a big covered dish. Then we'll, then we'll put a sheet over it and then we'll have evening service. And when we get through, we'll remove the sheet and eat what's left over, amen? amen. That sounds like a pretty good plan to you. Food poisoning all over that, you know what I'm saying? Hey, grab your Bibles and turn with me to Exodus chapter 19. And as you're turning, listen quickly because August is a humongous month for our church. Uh, This week, we start a whole new sermon series, more on that in just a moment, Uh, but next week, we will take some time during our morning service to hear a very important refresher presentation. Our master planning group, master planning committee, and our uh, transformation committee will be coming jointly uh, to refresh your memories from what we got within about five days of voting on in March when COVID struck. And so we're going to give you kind of a refresher presentation. Then we're going to take two weeks and uh, let you, again, have some time to pray about this. We'll be praying in all of our small groups together on the 16th of August, then coming back on the 23rd and uh, having a church conference. We will be having a joint church conference. We'll allow people to vote uh, distance from a distance on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And then we'll be having a live vote here in the church on Sunday the 23rd. So you have all of those things to look forward to. But today, uh, we start a new journey together. Now, I want you to kind of make a pledge. Uh, I, I try not to have you pledge very often. And, and don't make the pledge if you don't intend to keep it. But I'm just asking you really more than anything as your pastor to pray about making a pledge or a commitment. And not financially, believe it or not, from the Baptist Church. But... Um, a pledge to keep your sermon note cards from this series. I want you to think about doing something. I want you to think about for the next several weeks, because I don't know how many weeks it's going to be, because as you know, these are open-ended moments for us, open-ended moments for me. We may be here three or four months, who knows? But I'm asking that you find something to write with during this series and write down those moments of things that grip your heart, save your outlines, because you're going to need every one of these to make the transition that's in front of us. We won't make it on our own strength. So what I'm asking you to do for these next several weeks and maybe months is to not take a few notes, throw it in your Bible, leave it in the pew. Although that helps you for the moment, stay engaged. I'm asking you when you get home to find a safe and sacred place and say, you know, for some reason, Pastor felt led of the Spirit to ask us to save those for later reference. Maybe... Just maybe. He had an insight that we did not have at that moment. But look, now in April of 2021, the exact element that we talked about a year previous, we needed at this moment. So just a request, a petition, to maybe make a pledge or commitment to do that very thing. Save what you've written down because you know, come on, you and I know, man, we'll forget that in 10 minutes. Amen? We'll forget it. But if we could go back in these key moments that our church is transitioning, these heartfelt, Bible-filled messages, I think are going to speak volumes into our life. I just want you to know, before we get into this, what a struggle it's been for me. A struggle what to call this series a struggle to exactly where God wants us to go and what direction he wants us to take. And so for, this, for, for the last several months, I've just been hammering out. When we get to August, September, October, God, where do you want us to go? 
But God has just led on my heart this concept of this promising passage, a passage, a journey, a voyage, if you will, and the principles that go along with it. Now, now listen to me. If you and I, think about this, could tap into thousands of years of how God has used his people when they are facing a big task, not always a moving task, although that's what's ahead of us. But at times it's a rebuilding task. At times it's building a facility. God's people building the tabernacle, the temple. Those were huge moments. How did God interact with his people and what was their response? Where were they going in? Where were they during? Where were they after? If you and I somehow could reach into thousands of years of insights and true biblical principle of how God dealt with his people and how they responded, it could, it could, it possibly could give us tremendous strength in the days ahead that are facing our congregation. And so with that in mind, today I just want to start out kind of in the preparation phase. You see your outline there, you're already joining me in Exodus chapter number 19. And today as we start getting, just laying the groundwork of preparation, I want to talk to you really about this subject of commitment. The subject of commitment. Now today we are going to kind of solely focus on those early days of the children of Israel's wandering. Remember, what was it, 400 years? Just a hair over 400 years they were in bondage. They were in slavery. And with that in mind, finally, when they, I don't know whether we want to call it escaped or released, maybe a combination of those two. We know uh, up and through uh, the the book of Exodus, up until about chapter 19 or 20, we have the first mm, 70 or 75 days of that journey. Just a map behind me, not that we're going to refer to it, but just to kind of get your minds in sync again about the whole progression of coming out of that Nile Delta area, traveling down, downward, uh, along of of two two bodies of water, uh, but eventually ending up in a desert. Now, just from a time perspective, I just jotted my notes just for you history buffs. We're probably looking at 1446, about 1400 years prior to the coming of our Lord and Savior. No doubt we're looking at spring months, That calendar in Hebrew life doesn't always line up exactly with ours, but in our months, with quotations around it, the children were released somewhere in in that month of April, and uh, May and June had passed by, and uh, they had made their way southward, closer and closer through the, the, the desert of sin, the wilderness of sin, on down into the very desert of Sinai. And there they made some stops along the way. And today, as we read in just a moment from God's Word in Exodus 19, I want us to focus today on some truths that come out of Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 and 2 exclusively. Although at the end of our message today, we're going to look quickly at just one thing from Exodus chapter 14. Grab your Bibles. Let's read together. Exodus chapter number 19. Let's read from God's Word, verses 1 and 2. On the first day of the third month... That signifies to us about 60 days have passed since the actual release point. We know they have now crossed over the Red Sea and they are truly, truly now after two months into this journey experience, the passage of right, trying to make their way to the, to the Holy Land. So probably somewhere in the day, around day 61 to about day 75, Moses has not yet obviously gone up onto the Mount, uh, Mount Sinai that, that has not occurred yet in, in chronos or uh, chronology. And it says, after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. And uh, after they set out from their freedom, they entered the desert of Sinai. And Israel camped, some of you have encamped, they camped, encamped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Wow. The incredible moment that the children of Israel were freed. And to begin a multi-year 
passage or journey. And as they made their way and began making that pilgrimage southward and eventually to spend almost a solid year in the desert of Sinai, they did so with a lot of uncertainties, with so many unknowns. Now I want you to look carefully at these verses because this is why I think God has drawn me to share and communicate verses 1 and 2 out of the 19th chapter. There seems to be kind of three prerequisites, three steps, if you will, in order that they had to take to move forward to where Moses could go up for around 40 days. He spent, the Bible tells us, on Mount Sinai, receiving the tablets, receiving the law, receiving instruction, spending time in incredible fellowship with God like no other has ever been able to have. And there he was, perched on that mount. But to get there, it appears here in these verses there were several steps. I want you to look at them with me. And we'll just flesh them out here in just a moment because these steps lead us to some important truths about commitment. You and I do understand, don't we, that the number one issue that we will need to be able to accomplish anything for Christ is commitment. Can I hear an amen? We have nothing without being committed. I mean, it all starts with the commitment in your heart to be here, to be a part I mean, commitment is the catalyst to everything. Commitment was the catalyst 1,400, 1,500 years before the coming of Christ for a group of people that were also on a pilgrimage. They were also in a passage moment, passing from one place to a land that God had promised them. But it would be quite a passage experience. There would be many deaths. There would be many that would fall away. There would be many that did not make the journey. But yet in all of it, Commitment was the true catalyst that was able to see them through. But looking at these these verses, notice it's kind of interesting, isn't it? In verse 1, it just really gives us the location and the timing. We see we're moving a little after 60 days now in the journey. It tells us that in verse 1. It tells us where they're heading. They're, They're now moving into this area of the Sinai, Mount Sinai, the the Sinai Desert area. And in doing so, it tells us something interesting. It says there, almost as seemingly a second or a first of those steps, they left Rephidim. It was like they had to leave there in order to breach and go into the very edge of the desert and get closer to the location that God was going to give them the important law, God's holy word. And then the Bible says, as they approached it, they encamped there. What a fascinating statement. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. And then, ultimately, we know they passed in and passed into not just seeing at the edge, but entered into that desert. Almost three steps. They had to leave one place. They approached and camped there, looking at the mountain, and then they go in. They entered. And with each one of those prerequisites and steps, there come some interesting, interesting things for us to look at when it comes to commitment. So let's start with the first of these things about commitment. Jot it down with me. I want to talk to you first of all this morning about the commitment that it took God's children to leave in terms of weakness behind. Leaving weakness behind. Now, It may not mean anything to you, and for for most of you that are not Hebrew students, it wouldn't. I mean, it it shouldn't. But if you look carefully at the language study here, this word, rephidim, this location. The root word in the Hebrew language is interesting, means a place of decline, but really centered in an English language, it means weakness. The root word in the Hebrew location, rephidim, means weakness and as we just start looking at these principles of commitment I think it's significant and easy for us to miss these children of Israel were leaving a place of weakness when you go back and look at chapter 15 16 17 18 and 19 and let them hang together as the people move into this Rephidim area you see as they approached it and when they got there nothing good happened in that place 
Well, I guess Moses' father-in-law showing up was, might be considered a good thing. But other than that, almost every single thing, there had been whining that, le- that, that went on outside Rephidim about water and food. There had been these incredible moments of battle and war with Amalek, the Amalekites, If you'll remember where Moses, as long as he held that rod and that staff up, finally men had to prop his arms up because he became so fatigued. They were winning the battle. (laughs) Joshua and those warriors were winning the battle. But as soon as Moses got tired and dropped his arms, the Amalekites would swing back around and look like they were going to be victorious. I mean, mean, it was just a constant battle and a constant fight. There was was challenges there with Moses because he began to see what a humongous, what an enormous job this was leading almost two million people across the desert. And I know they were Baptists because they could not get along very often. The Bible says something interesting. Don't don't miss this. It says in verse number two, they left Rephidim. They left all that stuff behind. They left all that stuff in the rear view mirror. At some point, there had been enough commitment to say, good gracious, let's get out of this place. The challenges and the weakness that this place has brought has, has, has done damage to the two million people that we have here. And as we are preparing for God's passage and holding on to his word, understand it's going to take a lot of steadfast faith and determination and commitment. What were the weaknesses these people had? Well, we could say, first of all, unity and We could say, second of all, just disillusionment from leaving. Remember, the people wanted to go back. Are you kidding me? You want to go back under Pharaoh's slavery? Yes, at least we had food there. You had that set, that group of people that were whining, that wanted to do, uh, I mean, wanted to do something different. Isn't it amazing when people ask for leadership's help to go someplace, and then they get in that process, and they cry and say, yes, but we didn't want to do it that way. Moses, we asked for your help, but we didn't want to do it that way. We we didn't want it with manna. We wanted it with the buffet table that we had in Egypt. Isn't it possible for us to be free and have the buffet? Isn't that interesting? And so in leaving those weak moments behind, I think more than anything, and jot this down, wrong thinking so often leads to so many and even most of our difficulties. Wrong thinking, misdirectional thinking. Have you ever stopped to think, and and again, I share this with you often because I think about things like this. What was in, forget Moses for a moment, forget Aaron and all key leadership of the Israelites for a moment. Those are who we so often focus on. What about just the average Joe out there in, 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 in in, in that menagerie of two million people? What about the unknown guy over there in the tribe of Benjamin in tent number 1187 with his aunt and all the problems that he had and his family issues, putting that tent up, setting it down, moving it, trying to figure out, couldn't hear, everything came secondhand through tribal leadership, all the issues that they had. What was that guy thinking? I mean, I mean, I mean, what was the two million people? What were they thinking during that moment? About where they were going and how long it would take there. But I mean, they didn't know it. They didn't have answers to any of those things. All they knew is that their great grandfather had died in Egypt and he hated it. All they knew is that their grandfather had died in Egypt, a slave, and he hated it. And many of them were able to travel with their father and mother who had for 60, 70, 80 years been in, in, in bondage of slavery and they hated it. But they were wi- willing in Egypt to move away from the weakness of what they had. They came to Rephidim. They had as many challenges, at least in a condensed time, not as many as they had in Egypt over 400 years, but they had a number of challenges and they were willing to leave it behind. 
So I just stopped for a moment and thought, you know, what are our weaknesses here at Oakland Heights? Those that we've got to be able to move away from. And almost all of them came from issues related to thinking. And if you trace the whole Exodus experience, one of these times you ought to do that. Just pull up on the screen, easy, Google. Just, just, you know, just pull up chronology, Israelite Exodus. And man, they got it by the chapter, by the year. I mean, all those teaching tools are at your disposal right there on the screen. And just kind of refresh your memory of all the things that the people went through. It's amazing. And then go back and look at how many of those impacted, were impacted by what? Their thinking And so out in the margin somewhere as a bonus, just as an extra, understand that attitude is the thing that you and I have the opportunity to choose every single day. We're going to choose our attitude. No one's going to choose that for you. Every single day, you and I choose what attitude we're going to have. And by the way, if you have not figured out, that controls the congregational tempo and energy in any environment. The choice, the choice that you and I make in terms of attitude. And by the way, just as another extra, it controls the happiness in the environment as well. The happiness. Now we know joy lasts forever. Happiness is temporary and that's what we're talking about here. In the temporary, your attitude controls happiness. But I wrote down four things that we share with these people. Number one, they saw the challenge and had the challenge of obstacles versus opportunities. Obstacles versus opportunities. You and I got to decide how we're going to see things. Now, the people could have said, woohoo, we are done 400 stinking years with Egypt. And Lord have mercy, we're out from underneath that. Pharaoh and his men have been swept up in that Red Sea. Woo! But almost immediately, what was it? Less than 60 days. Well, we don't have enough to eat. Well, that's the issue, isn't it? We better go back. And God says, well, let me give you some quail. Let me give you some manna. Well, we're going to get tired of that. And then there was the issue with water. Hey, we're out in the desert area. How's there going to be enough water for two million people? I can just imagine. Out of that rock came the water God provided. I bet somebody in one of those tents said, you know what? This this is a little musty and stale tasting water. We had one of those deep wells in Egypt. It was like Ozarka water. It was a lot better. You know, you and I choose how we see things that have happened to us. I wrote down COVID. You know, are we going to sit around here and walk? well, well, we got to wear a mask. Or are we going to look out the fact, hey, half our church family's already coming back. You choose how you see that. Or we could take a worship bulletin today and we look down at the bottom and say, wow, wow. million has already come in in our building commitment over 36 months. And we still got nine or 10 months to go to achieve greater. And that's through two incredible, incredible, difficult stretches for our church. Do we look at the new property payoff and say, wow, 1.25 million already put on that only down to about $500,000 left. Or do we say, well, look, well, look, we got $500,000 left to go. How do we look at this steeple moment? Is that devastation to us or is that an opportunity? I have not heard one person yet standing out in the parking lot and say, wow, brand new maintenance-free steeple 5,000 pounds lighter than the last one, and it looks amazing. Even the area hawks like to roost on it. As you get this brochure from the church, you'll see the picture of the old steeple embedded in the sanctuary roof and the new one in incredible sunrise panoramic fashion. Which do you choose to look at? 
Which do you choose to embrace? See, that thinking and attitude, so important, obstacles. I wrote down this, do we focus again on what we have or what we don't have? Becky and I will get in the car in a moment. Here we go again. Where do you want to go for lunch? Well, baby, we've been wearing our mask. It's COVID. I don't care. I want to go get some for lunch. I'll say, what do you want? She'll say, I don't know. What do you want? And I'll say, well, you chose last week. No, no, it, it, it's your time to choose this week. I, I chose last week. But as we do, we're not going to talk about who's not here. Our focus is going to be on who is here. What do you choose? What you have, what you don't have. I mean, think about the children of Israel. They had this challenge, didn't they? Well, we don't have water. Well, we don't have food. Well, you remember this? We don't have a voice in making decisions. Somebody's making decisions for us. Aaron, who gave the right for Aaron to be the priest? Who chose the Levites to be the tribe that got to be the priest? Who, who, who did that? All those things God had given them. Freedom. Sending them to a promised land giving them Gerber food, water, Gerber food, food, safety and security and leadership and covering tent for their heads. But they chose to focus on what they did not have. And I would just suggest to you as we get ready for this presentation next week, we've made a commitment to pay for this thing as we go, to not have long-term sustained debt. That's the commitment we've made as a church. And so we can choose to say, well, look, only 25,000 square feet. Or we can look at it and say, wow, 25,000 square feet. Seven times more than what Oakland Heights started with here at this location in 1957 in a little bitty chapel in a few rooms built over here, right over here on Eden Drive. We're going to make that choice. Attitude. I jotted down a third thing, not just obstacles and opportunities and focusing on what we now have, but we, the attitude that, that, that plays such an important part on choosing our words and actions. The attitude of choosing our words and actions and us forgetting to ask the questions, will this help the cause? Is this going to build us up? Will this be beneficial to our people? See, for the two million people, there should be one thing on their mind. How do we get there? How do we successfully make the journey? How does the passage, how does it become the significant journey that we need it to be? Everything should be guided by that question. And so, over here when there's private conversations in the tent and Reuben tribe, those individuals should be asking themselves the question, is what we're about to say about Moses beneficial? Is that building up the body? Is that helping all the tribes encompass great things to make the journey and be successful? We want to be a, make it not just a successful journey, but a significant journey. We want to have kingdom impact. That's where God is leading us. Is what we're about to say going to be helpful? Is it going to be supportive of Moses? Is it going to lift him up? Is this going to hurt her? Is this going to hurt him when we say this, when we do that? See, our attitudes are reflected in our actions and what we're saying. But I wrote down a fourth thing, something we got to get better at. And that is being willing to move from a place of weakness and understanding that that takes great energy. Moving from a place of weakness takes tremendous energy. You might want to write this word down, revitalization. Revitalization. We know when you break that word down what it means. Re is to do over or to restart something. Vital, vitality is life. It comes out of the zoo or zoa concept. And then that last R is the process. Revitalization is the process to see it ensue. You and I are not just making a physical journey, but we're making a what? An internal journey of trying to revitalize this church. 
We're trying to literally bring it back to life. And can I just share with you, the average church goer does not understand how much energy it takes. Becky and I sat three and a half years ago in a cold winter, New Mexico night near our fireplace with some people huddled up called a pastor search committee from Oakland Heights Baptist Church. Becky brought that up to me the other day and reminded me. As we looked at that group in that circle trying to explain to them, guys, y'all you don't understand the amount of energy this is going to take to do what you're asking to do. It's going to be enormous. It's going to be costly. Have y'all really prayed through and thought about revitalization? That's why most churches that get to the stage where Oakland Heights are in seven or eight years just fade out and then we plant something new. It's so much easier to regenerate I mean, I mean, to start new life fresh than it is to regenerate old life. Just like if somebody falls out, and I hope they don't, and, and they're not breathing today, and somebody runs over there, and they start putting tremendous energy on that chest. Hey, we're going to give you CPR. We're going to try to bring you back to life. It takes a lot of energy. A lot easier to swat a little behind that we had in our church this week. We'll show that picture next week. One of our great young couples had a beautiful boy born this week. A little swat and life's on its way. I stopped this week at a place called, you ever heard of it? Home Depot. Drove my old truck up there, needed to put some things in the back. Lo and behold, two spots over. Another man, he was grabbing his mask. I was grabbing my mask. He, he jumped out and he said, what model's your old truck there? And I looked and he had one that almost as old, not quite as old. And I said, mine's a 74. He says, mine's an 81. As we kind of walked into the store together, he said something that was very, very important and had a lot of common sense to it. He said, you know, there's something about these old trucks. Man, they run forever. But man, isn't there something maintenance-wise to do on them all the time? Anytime you're trying to bring something back to life, there's something to do all the time. Tremendous energy that it takes. Tremendous sacrifice to bring it to where it needs to be. Tremendous effort it's going to take to get these people from Egypt, wandering two million of them, to a place called the very chosen place, the promised land. It's going to take enormous energy, action, and effort. Well, let's jot down a second very important thing about commitment. Not only did we just mention about commitment is really about leaving our weaknesses behind. Are you willing to make that kind of commitment? To not be part of gossip? To look for the positive? I mean, it's going to take that kind of effort or we we won't make it. It's going to take everybody in here stepping up. This is not going to be an easy journey. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to be costly. It's going to be difficult. There's going to be unexpected things come up. Time and time again that we didn't, hey, we we didn't see that coming. No, we didn't. We didn't see our steeple blowing off. I mean, who in their right mind walks up and says, hey, you know, I just have a feeling the steeple's gonna blow off in the church and a million and a half dollars worth of storm damage is gonna happen today in our church. I mean, who thinks about that? Who wakes up and says, you know what? The whole world's about to shut uh, shut down because of something called COVID-19. The world economy is gonna start screeching to a crawl. I mean, nobody sees those kind of things coming. But it's that leaving the weakness of the attitude and wrong thinking that makes the difference. But there's also a second commitment. Let's talk about it quickly. The commitment to one another. The commitment to one another. Now, I want you to look at your text very carefully. I'm going to show you something that probably, well, maybe Dr. Farrell, I don't know, Malcolm May, but very few people in here are going to know this. When you look at this language It's fascinating to me. Look in verse 2. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai and Israel. Now here it is. NIV translates this. Now this is important. Stay with me. Israel camped there. Do you see that? Israel, one nation, camped there. Now in the English language, what's so hard about us, uh, for, for us to grapple with this is this. We have all these additional words that we better understand to make things singular or plural. They, I, pronouns that communicate two or more to us, other pronouns, he or she that communicate one. 
But you would not know this, but the verb there, camp or encamped, very significant. It's, 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 it's fascinating because here, this is in, in the Hebrew, in the original Hebrew, it's a singular verb. It's used from the object as singular. So the English, the, when they translate, they did the best they could. They said one nation, Israel. They didn't say all the people. They chose to translate this in IV wise, Israel camped. Now, why is that so important? It's so very important because as we understand this principle, it leads us that the meaning of the Israelites, they had a singular goal of bringing God's world into their hearts. They all camped, many of them, two million of them, but they as one camped facing Mount Sinai. That tells us something about their commitment as it was forming to one another. And by the way, just another side note, it's a question. Did you notice in verse one, it already told us where they were? And they were what? Going up to what? Mount, did you see it in verse one? They already told us that. Have you, have you, have you ever thought about why did they circle back around in verse two and say it two more times? Two more times, did you see it? And, and, and they entered the desert of Sinai, middle of verse two, and here it is again. And then there in the desert, it tells us a third time. Why do you think it was so important for them to circle around and around and around and tell us over and over and over? Here they are at the brink. Here they are at the brink of the desert. I think much of it had to do with the humility. Those two million people began to see, first of all, the expanse of that mount and that desert. Coming out of that area of weakness, they began to see, wow, this is huge. You know, you and I go into this and we've got to have a tremendous commitment to one another. Tremendous commitment. We're always talking about people that are really connected. You know, two questions that may help you to know if you're really connected to your church family and two questions or a question that will help you really understand if you're committed to your family. If you were to ask the question, number one, if you and I did not come home tonight, who would miss us and why in our family? That might say volumes about how connected you are. If I didn't come home tonight, who in my house would miss me? And why? Well, we hope Becky Cook's going to miss me. We hope she misses me more because the paycheck will be missing. Not a real big paycheck, but a paycheck. But you know, when it comes to our church family, we have people so often that are out on the perimeter of things. I hear this often. Well, that, well, that family's not really connected. We see them once in a while, but they're not really connected. You know, all of us ought to ask this question. If we didn't return to our church next week, who would really miss us? And why? I think those people, as they stood there at that expanse of that desert, about to go over that threshold, began to think about the immensity of what that journey they're about to go on. I mean, that's this incredible moment. And they came to the desert. And they came to the desert. And they came and entered the desert. A place that was too big for them. A place now that reliance, we've already seen water's got to come from rocks. And there's got to be this miraculous delivery of food or we're not going to make it. And, you know, Oakland Heights may be at that point. God, this is, it, this is a big passage. It's a promising passage, but it's a big one. And we, we're, we're starting to understand our reliance, Lord, has got to be on you. Not something, this is, this, this is bigger than who we are. This is greater in scope than who we are. Incredible moment. The commitment to one another. You know, I jotted down something and I want you to jot it down too. You know, as the challenge escalates, the need for teamwork must elevate. As the challenge escalates, and man, do we have challenges in front, the need for teamwork, you and I working together, has got to escalate. You know what that comes down? It comes down to trust, doesn't it? I gotta be able to trust you and you gotta be able to trust me. You, you ought to look to that person left and right. We hope that six feet or more, unless you're in a nuclear family, from you. And you, know, you gotta be able to look down that pew week after week and say, you know what, I trust her. I trust Jimmy Velvin, I trust her. I trust Dave Garish. I trust Malcolm Palmer. I, I mean, I trust, I trust. And by the way, 
How do we define trust? Trust is nothing more than two parties doing the right things. Two parties doing the right things. Asking questions like, can I trust you? Are you really committed to this journey? Are you committed to the passage, to excellence? And by the way, do you really care about me? Do you care beyond the fact that I can articulate God's word? Do you care about me as a person? As a human being? All of us ask that question. We ask that of our small group. Hey, do you people in this room care about me? As a person, what I'm going through? Our students ask that of our leadership. Hey, Pastor Jared. Hey, Pastor Mike. In fact, they're coming to our home tonight. It's like, hey, do you care about me? Yeah, I care about you, not only to love you and care about you, but I care enough to, 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 to cook two briskets all night the night before so you can have homemade chopped beef tonight. Yeah, I, I care about you. Inside and out. Care about your dating life. Care about your life with your par parents, parental life. Care about your academic life. And certainly, certainly I care about your spiritual life. And what God's doing in your heart. And if God's calling you to be a missionary or a pastor or a coach or a lawyer or a banker, if he's calling you to weld in some shop one day or to fix air conditioning units, whatever he's calling you to do, I care about that call on your life. That's what real trust is. Can I count on you? And you and I have got to understand that our reliance on one another is significant. It's, it's, it's significant because, you know, can, I, I just got to stop here. Can you imagine Moses? I mean, think about this for a moment with me. God gives them water. And there are those that are complaining that it's coming out of a rock. God gives them food. And there's, those are saying, we don't like quail. We're vegetarians. We don't like manna. Can you imagine at that moment what Moses must have felt and what he thought as he processed through this? I mean, think about that for a moment. I mean, this was an incredible moment when those types of things began to happen. You think Moses ever stopped and said, hey, man, we need to be excited about what the Lord's provided for us and we gotta pull together. I think at this moment, three times when it tells us in the Hebrew language, and they stopped there and there was a desert. Oh, oh, and they came to the desert and there it was, the immense challenge in front of them. Oh, 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 and at the desert, the incredible challenge that was from them. I think they began to see, hey, we're not gonna be able to accomplish this thing by ourselves. Not one group, no matter how much money they have. Not one group, no matter how powerful they have. All, we all, we all have gotta to come together because that's the only way we're gonna be able to accomplish things collectively that we could never accomplish individually. Caring about one another, a commitment to one another. Last thing. A commitment to step-by-step -step faithfulness. Now, I want you to remember this one. So important as we continue through this process. Step-by-step -step faithfulness. I want you to do this for me. I want you to turn your Bibles back to Exodus chapter 14 and just stop there for a moment. Exodus chapter 14, before we close. Exodus 14, let it fall back a few pages to the left. And let's think for just a moment. As the children began to wander and make their exodus, wasn't it interesting, even prior to the Red Sea experience, here's what we think. We think growing up that the children of Israel, uh, they, the Red Sea was right next to that Nile Delta area where they escaped. And so God opened the Red Sea the very first day, the very first moment that they escaped, and and, and, and God washed out opposition. But you began to look at the timeline and you see there, were, there was time prior to that experience of the Red Sea. It's interesting because in chapter 14, look in verses one and two, it's interesting there because God brings them and tells Moses exactly where he wants them to camp. Do you see that by definition? He said, the Lord says to Moses, hey, I want you to go over there to, to, uh, to uh, fire, fire higher off and Migdal at the sea. And I want, you to, I want you to camp, camp just opposite. I want you to turn your camp just opposite on the other side there of Baal Zephon. And, and that's where I want you to be. Of all things, not to immediately get as far away 
from this crazy Pharaoh as you could. But God says, no, I want you to circle around and I want you to come back and here's how I want you to count. Here's exactly where I want to place you. And can you imagine looking at these despairing shores of the Red Sea and the Israelites? I mean, they couldn't even see beyond the distance. They had no binoculars to see Canaan. They couldn't even see. I mean, they couldn't see anything at this point. And even when they come to Sinai down into chapter 17 or 19 where we are, I mean, even at that moment, the desert seemed to them to have no end. I want you to listen to what one of the commentators said. I love this. His name is C.H. McIntosh. He was a 19th century, that means 1800s if you're not a history kind of person, a guy that, that wrote tremendous a tremendous amount of information about Scripture. He had an interesting philosophy on the crossing of the Red Sea. McIntosh believed that the Red Sea didn't divide all at once, but it opened progressively. As Israel moved forward, so they needed to trust God with each fresh step. Listen, to, and, I, and I quote him, listen to what McIntosh said. God never guides for two steps at a time. He said, I must take one step and then get light to take the next step. This keeps my heart abiding and have abiding dependence on him. Now, I don't know. We can go home at lunch uh, uh, and, and, and have a big discussion about this. Can you believe the pastor suggested? No, I didn't suggest it. That's just what Mac- Macintosh believed. But, you know, maybe he's right. Maybe he wasn't. Did the Red Sea just open up? Everything was dry. People crossed over all at once. Or was it a progressive opening? But here's what I do know. Our Bible teaches us over and over that our faith in him is a progressive following. Little by little, listen to God's word. The pillar of cloud led them forward day by day, Nehemiah 9, 19. Day by day, the Lord pours his steadfast love upon me, Psalm 42, 8. Your strength, Psalm 110, 3, be renewed day by day like the morning dew. Give us... Day by day, our what? Daily bread. Give us on this day, Lord. Give us on this day, Lord. Give us on this day, Luke 3, our daily bread. You remember this? Paul's incredible words in 2 Corinthians 4, 16. Therefore, don't lose heart. Although what? The outer man is perishing, wasting away, for the inward man is being renewed day by day. And so I would just suggest to you, That when our God says, Moses, I want you to turn and I want you to camp. Right there, chapter 14, verses 1 and 2. Right there is where I want you to be. I know it's in between Pharaoh and that water. He he was doing so, putting them in, in, in the midst of an entrapping sea and a terrible army on the other side. And it was like, Lord, I... Moses had to ask, are you sure you want us right there? Right there, Moses, right there. And when you and I are in a difficult place, we've got to realize that either the Lord has placed us there or he's allowed us to be there. But regardless, listen to me. I wrote down a very important thing for all of us to understand. Simply this, God means for you to be there. God means for you to be there. It hasn't caught him by by surprise or off guard. You're in Exodus chapter 14. Would you go down as we close to verse 15? We all face some tough days. Churches face tough days. One of our small group leaders leaders the other day made this statement in our meeting and man, she was right on target. She, she was just talking about some of the challenges that we face. All, all of the challenges are legitimate. And really, many of the challenges all of our churches are facing corporately together across the, the world today. It's interesting. But you know, in the midst of that, whether or not we can say, well, we're a little different, Pastor. We were displaced five months because of storm damage. 
Yeah, but we can either look at that or say, man, the Lord provided us a place across the street to go. Yeah, but the Lord's hitting us hard. Some people left, steeple blew off, now we're in this terrible pandemic. Just remind you, God means for us to be right where we are. He's not caught off guard that we're here. And either he's placed us here or he's allowed us to be placed here and maybe only known to him the reason why. But isn't it amazing as God's people are in this crucible in the 14th chapter how verse 15 above all the verses around it just stand out. Look at it. NIV says, then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Here you are in a tough place. Why cry out to me? And then the Lord just says, tell the Israelites to move on. I love how the revised and King James terms that last statement. They also say, the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? But then they say, tell the children of Israel to what? To go forward. And so one final thing I want you to write down on this, the Lord's morning. When unsure, just take the next logical step by faith. What is the next step, Lord, by faith? No question to leave Rephidim. Leave that, leave that place of weakness. But as they looked at that daunting desert, Well, what's the next step? Then take the next logical step. These principles circling around, very important. Would you stand with me this morning? And you and I are going to have a time of corporate prayer for our church. We're going to pray for our nation today. I'm going to lead our prayer time, but you also join me in praying. Lord, we thank you for these moments that you have given us in the power and the authority of your word. Lord, we just first want to say that we're thankful for what you have given us, where you've placed us. In this moment, this time, we are thankful. And as we too are a body of Christ making passage, we look today to your word to just try to envelop those principles that we find encompassed in your word that that will rub salve in some hurt places, that will bring courage and bravery to those places of uncertainty. But Father, today we have, your Holy Spirit has brought challenge to our hearts preparation for this journey, commitment, and it's going to take all of us. Father, for all those things that are in our church life at this moment, whatever they may be, that are not beneficial and not helpful to making the journey, I pray that you would just deliver us from those. In those places where it may be evilness in a heart, I pray that your Holy Spirit would minister to that heart. Father, today we pray for our church in provision. The task looks daunting. The journey too far and too big. And so maybe there is a a challenge in some hearts to say, let's shrink back. Let's go backwards. Let's go back. But I pray that we may look to you for direction. We look to you for resource. And Father, as we take just the next logical step, we do so knowing that when our foot hits the ground, then you will make plans and preparation for the next step. Help us truly live faith by faith, day by day, true fellowship in you. Father, we pray for unity. We pray for the ability that we can count on our neighbor. We pray for those in our church family to have an attitude of upbeat, not downbeat. 
of excitement, not discouragement. That as we know obstacles will slam against us, that we will not shrink back, but we will see what positive we can find in every, each and every of those situations. Father, we, we pray for other churches in our city. We're not the only one that has challenges. Pray for a sister church today that's gone through a tragic situation with a pastor. The brokenness and the heartache in that body. Pray for another sister church today that has no pastor. Pray for other churches today that are not even able yet to meet together. We pray for them today, their effectiveness. Father, help us to remember that this journey is not about success. Our lives is, are not about success. Success ends with our death. But our journey and our lives are all about, they're all about the important element. The important element. The strategic element of significance. Help our passage be significant where we invest in other lives. Long after we're gone, we have built into other lives so that we live on, the purpose lives on, kingdom work lives on. Father, we take a moment this morning to pray for America. Our nation is divided. There are camps. There are polarizations. And Father, I just pray that somehow that you would do a work in our nation. Begin to heal those fragments. Pull us together. Allow us to find common ground. Father, we pray for the world around us. Many of those nations hurting as well. Father, we pray for now hundreds and hundreds of thousands of families all over this world that have lost life in the midst of this terrible scourge, this pandemic. We pray for those families that have sustained loss. Father, as we make our way from this place of worship today, I pray that we do so looking to you, focused on you, centered on you and what your will is. What is it you desire us to do? But more importantly, in each life that's represented in this body of Christ, who is it that you want us to become in you? Knock off those rough edges. Pull us together. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.